words so many times, let's make a table. Great right? for laziness. Uh, postulate one. Observables and operators are related. In particular, for every physical observable in the world, there exists an operator. Postulate two. Measurement collapses the wave function. Let's call it uh, WF, because I'm going to be writing that all day. Uh, postulate three. There exists a state function that allows expectation values to be calculated. Four, uh, the wave function evolves according to the time-dependent shooting equation. Schrodinger equation. So these are the four postulates, and later on we'll come back to a postulate zero, uh, which kind of feels like cheating, but not really. It has to do with uh, the existence of spin. Uh, postulate one. marker starts getting too light, let me know and I'll, I'll uh, switch. Uh, so each self-consistent well-defined uh, observable Linear operator that satisfies the eigenvalue, we call it eigensystem. here. And that equation is A, put a hat on top of that, phi is equal to little a phi. So I'm saying that A is the observable. saying that a hat is the operator. Uh, little a is my eigenvalue, right? If you have an eigen system equation, you've got an operator, you've got an eigenfunction on both sides, and you have a uh, eigenvalue. measurable value.
So when I said that uh, SZ was H bar over 2, that's because when I put the operator in for spin, the eigenvalue coming out is H bar over 2. Right, it's plus or minus H bar over 2. And lastly, uh, phi is the eigenfunction. And if you have this system, for every eigenvalue, you have a different eigenfunction. So oftentimes, we will use phi sub a, where a specifies it is the eigenfunction for a particular value of eigenvalue. And this is it. Uh, so you may be thinking, what, what's an operator? Well, uh, I say that operators are things or mathematical expressions that operate on functions. And that is a very general way of putting it. And the, the reason I put it that way is because a lot of the operators that we see uh, are not necessarily easy to write. Uh, but we do write them nonetheless, and that allows us to make a measurement. So for example, dx is an operator, and we can say that is the derivative with respect to x, which means that if I have dx operating on some function of x is equal to df of x by dx. I could have an operator which rotates the function. I'll call this rz90. We'll say that it rotates the function by 90 degrees around the z-axis. means that Rz90 operating on x squared plus y is equal to y squared minus x. Because I just took, I, I rotated uh, a particular function around the z-axis by 90 degrees. I can say whatever b hat is and 5 by 3, well, then b hat operating on phi is equal to 1 third phi. And lastly, everyone's favorite, we can have an identity operator, which says do nothing. So an identity operator, which we see in, in a, a symmetry all the time would be some i hat operating on g is equal to function back without any change. So these are examples of operators. Uh, now, our physically meaningful uh, observables all have operators, and these come about from a variety of ways, but the way that you can start by thinking about them is you can think about them as <coughs> operators in the classical world, which then are quantized through the addition of you know, h bars and, and uh, uh, i's. And if you see it long enough, you'll eventually start seeing there's a pattern to it. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to get you comfortable with just what these are and, and what should be doing them. So let's take the example of linear momentum. And linear momentum, I'm going to use little p for that. So that's my, my observable. 
my operator is going to be little p hat, and the operator, it so happens, is equal to minus i h bar times gradient. And this p, I should point out, is a vector. So let me, uh, let me put a vector symbol under there, which means a single uh, direction, for example, the x direction, is going to be p sub x hat is equal to minus i h bar uh, derivative of with respect to x. So we can work in one dimensional space and just think about a, a 1D system. So we've got uh, an operator. And that means that I can go back and apply this operator to this equation and we can find solutions. So we'll say p x hat times phi, and phi is just a function of x only, we're going to use a one dimensional example, is equal to negative i h bar derivative with respect to x, phi x is equal to p x the x. So that is my eigenvalue. And this is the problem now that we're trying to solve. to uh, you know, say there's a system to this, but it turns out solving differential equations, a lot of these are just about knowing the answer or having a good guess and putting a guess in and throwing away the parts that don't work. Uh, but we know that if our uh, operator is just a single derivative, that our one solution And there are many solutions. Uh, those of you who've seen partial differential equations know that uh, you can have uh, a particular solution and then a general solution. But one particular solution to this is phi x is equal to a e to the i k x. So this is a plane wave. Now, I want to point out that there's a really handy relationship, and you're going to see it over and over and over again. So I would say go home, learn where this came from, and uh, you'll absolutely love it, because it makes your life livable. I X. So there's a relationship between exponentials and sines and cosines. And the reverse holds as well. There's a relationship between sines and cosines and exponents. Uh, again, crazy useful, and we're going to be using it through the rest of the class, so look it up. There's also a relationship between uh, exponentials without the, uh, without the imaginary component and uh, hyperbolic sine and cosine, which you'll also see later in the class, but it's really useful. So we got this. And let's uh, let's make a substitution over here. Uh, okay, tired orange, just try red. A E to the I K 
kx is equal to minus i h bar i k a to the e i kx. Right? And that's why we guessed an exponent, because you take the derivative of it, you get the exponent back, which satisfies this. So exponents are great. We're going to be seeing that a lot just because we're going to be dealing with derivatives so often. So okay, that makes this px hat, this px, this uh, px, the observable, and this px. So we've got a solution. Uh, I, to remind you, is square root of negative 1. So you've got a negative, square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 gives you negative 1. So the negative and the negative 1 cancel each other out. And we get px is equal to h bar k phi is equal to a e d i k x. And that is the solution for uh, linear momentum. Now, the you know, system here is being set up so it's the linear momentum for a particle that's just floating in space. And that means it can take any value. And this k, the wave vector, or in this case, it's the x component of the wave vector, because it should be a vector in and of itself if you had a three-dimensional system, it can take any value. Uh, right? So wave vector is at uh, k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of this wave traveling in space. <clears throat> well, it's not really quantized, right? Because it can take any value. And that's because the quantization comes from the boundary conditions. So let's, let's apply a boundary condition that will allow us to have a, a solution that looks quantized. otherwise known as periodic boundary conditions. Born on we call it born on carbon because it makes you sound sophisticated. They're periodic boundaries, meaning that you've got some box, it's a 1D box, the particle is doing its thing in here. When it comes out one side, it loops back around and comes back in the other. And the box will give it some size. And that size is what's going to give you the quantization. So we'll call the box size L. Another way to think of this is you can think of it as a ring. right? So you can say, oh, well, what I really have is I have a, a ring. So as this particle you know, goes around, it comes back. And the boundaries at the ring, they have to match. So we can say, uh, R is equal to L over 2 pi. In any <clears> case, you want to visualize it that way. So, okay, we've got uh, boundary conditions, and we only need one boundary condition because the differential we're solving only has one derivative. So, we can say that phi at 0 is equal to phi at L. Right? So this is our... Uh, <coughs> x direction, which means that a e to the i k 0 is equal to a e to the i k l, which isn't obviously solvable, so we go and we substitute in our sines and cosines, so what we're going to get, we can cancel the a's out, we get cosine of k 0 
plus i sine k0 is equal to cosine kL plus i sine kL. This is 0, because the sine is 0 is 0. This is equal to 1, uh, because this is the imaginary part, this is the real part. That means that our imaginary part must be 0, and our real part must be 1. And the only way that happens is when KL over here is equal to 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, dot, 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 dot. So if we divide by L, that gives us that K is equal to N 2 pi over L, where <clears throat> N is integer. And we now have a quantized solution. Uh, now, it's worth pointing out, coming back to this idea of, of a ring, that we have uh, n 2 pi over l. Uh, and going back to the de Broglie hypothesis, right? Remember the de Broglie hypothesis? We had p is equal to h bar k. And what he wound up with was uh, here is l is equal to 2 pi r, so you get n pi equals 2 pi r. Uh, and that meshes in with the, the Bohr modeled at the atom as well. So the Bohr modeled atom works because we are forcing our solution to be quantized uh, around a circle. So from my perspective, this is also this the fact that the boundary conditions are where you get the quantization is what makes nanoscience interesting. Uh, nanoscience in the modern world has kind of devolved into let's make things really small and have a lot of surface area. But when it was first you know, considered, people were interested in having uh, boundaries that were small enough that you could tune the boundary conditions, right? If you could make you know, a, a nanowire and tune the length, you could ch change what the states were. So that, that was the plan. Uh, questions about what we've done so far? This is all in just the x direction, right? That's all in the x direction, yep. But uh, you can uh, do the, uh, the y and z directions. It turns out that you can write these out, and the x, the y, and the z directions, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, del, that uh, allows you to separate out all three separate from each other. <clears throat> OK, so uh, these operators uh, are, and the concepts here, are coming from Hamiltonian mechanics. And again, I'm not going to go into detail about that. I can tell you that uh, the classical mechanics and even you know, elements such as the uh, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, arise from classical mechanics as, as well. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to just talk about uh, other operators. And in the case of Hamiltonian mechanics, we write the Hamiltonian operator. Hamiltonian operator is what we use in classical mechanics uh, basically for, for solving uh, the, the mechanical system. And it's the sum of the uh, kinetic and potential energies. So the Hamiltonian, which you can write as a fun H, and I 
love writing this H, uh, is equal to T plus B. So for me, this is going to be kinetic energy. <coughs> and this is going to be potential energy. Uh, for the sake of our first problem, we're going to want the potential energy to just be zero. So it's going to be a particle floating in, floating in free space. There's nothing constraining it. The, the potential energy, that's going to be, for example, you have a, a, a nucleus and an electron, and the electron is being bound by that nucleus because of the Coulomb attraction. Uh, and we're going to ignore that for right now, but you should recognize that when you have this type of Coulomb attraction that goes to 1 over R, that's your boundary condition. And it's the Coulomb attraction and this potential energy that are going to be quantizing the, the states around an atom. <coughs> but right now, we're going to let this be zero. Which means we have the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy uh, is going to be the linear momentum squared divided by 2m, just from, from classical uh, mechanics. And then we can go back and substitute in our momentum operator to get 1 over 2m negative i h bar del squared, which is negative h bar squared over 2m del squared. So that's the Laplacian operator. The Laplacian, to remind you, del squared is equal to del dot del, or the derivative with respect to x squared plus d by dy squared plus d by dz squared in Cartesian coordinates. If you go to spherical coordinates, which is what we'd use for atoms, and it becomes uh, decidedly less pleasant. But uh, nonetheless, this is the operator, and you're going to be seeing a lot of this. Uh, so let's, let's go from the Hamiltonian operator and this general Laplacian to just a one-dimensional problem again. Uh, it makes the math easier. Again, you can separate out the x, the y, and the z components, uh, so it, it becomes uh, relatively easy to solve just tedious because you have to deal with all three dimensions. So, 1D, Hamiltonian. Uh, B equals zero. That gives us H is equal to negative H bar over 2M. That, uh, yeah, D squared x squared. So that gives us uh, an expression for the energy. And something you may have seen in undergrad uh, intro to physics class, h v is equal to v v. People refer to that as the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, and it, it, it is, because that's what we call it. Call it something else, it'd still be true, I guess. But this is the time independent shooting area equation. And we put in there negative h bar squared over 2m d squared dx squared phi is equal to e phi. And we say, what solves this? And the answer is plane waves, because the answer is always plane waves. Not always, but it's, it's a pretty good first guess. So we'll guess the plane wave solution. And I know this is just the first postulate, but the later postulates follow pretty easy once you see some examples of, 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 uh, of what this is about. So let's guess phi is equal to a e to the i k x plus b e to the minus i k x. These are plane waves, and it's a sum of plane waves. One plane wave is going to the right, one is going to the left in one dimension, and that's because we have a change in the sign. Um, 
So we can dump this into our uh, equation, and we get uh, negative h bar squared over 2m d by x a i k e to the i kx plus b negative i k e to the negative i kx. Right, I passed the first of the two derivatives through, putting the second of the two derivatives through, I get negative h bar squared over 2m a i k squared e to the i k x plus b negative i k squared e to the minus i k x. Again, it's really nice that you're using exponentials because you can pull out the uh, coefficients in front of the x and they just keep stacking up in front. So this can then simplify into negative h bar squared over 2m negative k squared a e to the i kx plus b e to the minus i kx is equal to e so again, we return phi, which makes this our energy, our energy term, which means that when we make a measurement, you get E is equal to h bar squared k squared over 2m. And it's worth noting that this is consistent with the momentum, the linear momentum, right? here in the eigenfunction is that the momentum is telling you what the value is and this A or B is telling you is it going to the left or to the right. Uh, so as you may have kind of guessed, the energy and the linear momentum are uh, commensurate with each other. We can simultaneously know the momentum and the energy. And in quantum mechanics, we refer to that as saying that the operators commute. If A and B commute, then the eigenfunctions, so if they then they share eigenfunctions, and can be kind of measured. So the definition of commute, we use these uh, square operators. Again, this comes from, from classical mechanics. 
we say A and B, these square operators are, are uh, commutators. C-O-M-M-U-T-A-T-O-R. Commutators, not commuters. Uh, and the definition is if you put two items in these commutators, they return A, B, minus B, A. And they commute if equal to zero. Then they commute. So let's look at an example of that it's using uh, energy and momentum. So, energy and momentum, do they commute? Oops, wrong bracket. Px h. So that is negative i h bar d by dx, negative h bar squared over 2m d squared by dx squared. Uh, the way that I like to think about it, and for me it's just a handy tool, is I like to put in an imaginary or a fictitious function to test. So I always put in some you know, f of x here. And that's, my, that's my fictitious test function. It's easy to get lost in the algebra if you don't have something like that. So we'll write these guys out. And what we have is we have, uh, well, we have this. So we have negative i h bar e by dx, negative h bar over 2m e squared by dx minus negative h bar squared over 2m d squared by dx squared multiplied by negative i h bar d by dx and that whole thing multiplied by my test function. Now because the nature of these operators and I'm taking the derivative of h bar 2m it just passes right through, right? These are just constants. Same thing. Taking the second derivative of these, it just passes right through. Which means that I wind up with, I wind up with i h bar cubed over 2m d to the third by dx to the third minus i h bar cubed over 2m d cubed by d x cubed f x. And these two just add to 0, zero. So that tells us that these commute. And they're commensurate with each other. You can measure them both at the same time, and no problem. Uh, but there are cases where operators don't commute. And the example that most of you are probably familiar with is position and momentum. Position and momentum don't commute. And let's look at that. Position and momentum, you have px, x. Well, the momentum operator we know, negative i h bar d by dx. The position operator is just x. And that means that when we write out the commutation, 
we get negative i h bar d by dx of x minus x negative i h bar d by dx. And I guess we'll put our test function there. Which then turns into negative i h bar uh, x d by dx. And I'll put that test function inside. Uh, plus Skip a step there and confuse myself uh, the first or last time. So, uh, okay, just pull this out. Negative i h bar gets pulled out on either side. Uh, d by dx of x of f of x. So I take this test function and I put it into both the left and the right sides of my expression, minus x d by dx of f of x, which is equal to negative i h bar of x d by dx of f of x. So I operate, I took the derivative of x first, and then I keep the x and I take the derivative of f of x, so that's going to be plus f x d by dx. Sorry, I got that backwards out of my mouth. There's a DC by did. I use chain rules to put that up. Minus x d by dx f of x. So this and this cancel each other out. And that leaves you with, well, I'll put it up here, equals negative i h bar f of x. And that's because the x and the derivative uh, don't commute. And the same thing happens for y and z. Uh, so kind of the final comment here uh, before we, we break for the week. I want to point out that this is this uh, commutator relation is the origin of the uh, of the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that delta x delta p is larger than or equal to h bar over two. And where this comes from, it is called the Schwartz inequality. And oh yeah, I have a quick question. So, uh, would it be i h f x d d x or happened? Which line? Uh, because you have an f x uh, in uh, d over d x, uh, and then wait, wait, can you give me first, second, or third line? Uh, third line. On okay. The right. So you have uh, negative i h. Yeah. And then you have f x uh, d over d x. Okay, so what did I do here? What did I do? What I did is I put the f in here, so that a d or a dx is right. Yeah. This term here, uh, I'm using an i. Right. Oh, oh here's an i h bar. No, I can't no. tell. Oh, this, this side. Of the the right. Yeah, this right. side. Okay, yeah. so I pull the i h out. The x stays dx. Here I get f x. Well, I guess x. Yeah. Yeah, and then x. Okay. This is one. Oh, okay. So this, so this, uh, so this, this term and this term cancel. This is equal to one. So it's one multiplied by negative i h bar. So you get negative i h bar. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry, I missed the I missed the x there. So this Heisenberg uncertainty principle is from the, what's called the Schwartz inequality, uh, and there's a 
book, a textbook by Branson and Joshen, uh, where they, they step through this. Uh, and, and basically what comes out of this is that if you have two operators, A and B, and they do not commute, but instead provide you with a third operator, so in our case, that third operator was negative i h bar. So if then delta a delta b must be greater than or equal to one half the magnitude of the magnitude of the expectation value of that third operator. And in the case of momentum and position, that means that delta x, delta px is equal to uh, one half, one half uh, negative i h bar. And we got rid of the i because the, uh, uh, we just projected it into real space. So we're looking at the magnitude. So it's got to be h bar over 2. So that's, that's the, uh, the origin of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It has to do with the commutator relations. And this is a big thing because it, it means that uh, you know, there are you know, real limits to what we can measure. And these are statistically bracketed. Uh, and these are also tied to the operators and the fact that operators that don't commute limit what we can know about the world. And from a... a Kind of a, what I call it, applied perspective. If you think about this as uh, an implication for, for making a measurement. So, for example, you know, let, let's say that we, we measure the momentum, and in the doing so, the momentum we find uh, exactly uh, a wave function of uh, p to e to the i kx. We'll just let it be some plane wave. And we know exactly the wave vector, meaning we know exactly the momentum. And we know that the probability, B, B, uh, is equal to psi star psi, where the psi star, the star means complex conjugate. So if you have some uh, a plus b i an imaginary number, and we apply the complex conjugate, we get a minus b i. So basically, we put a negative sign in front of the uh, uh, i. Well, if we do this, then this tells us that. Just a coefficient in front of that. This marker is not performing quite the way I thought it would. Let's try something perhaps healthier. Then we'll wind up with a star e to the minus i kx a e to the plus i kx is equal to A star A e to the zero. E to the zero is one. And we write this A star A as uh, absolute squared. Uh, we call that you know, the mod squared. Uh, and But that's just a constant. And if this is the probability distribution, then that means that within space, the probability find it is constant. So that is squared. So if we make an exact measurement of the momentum, then we have absolutely no knowledge of the position. And you'll see uh, vice versa, it is true. That'll be, that'll be coming up later. So this is kind of where we're going to stop postulate one and move to postulate the next uh, the next three. Uh, questions about postulate one. 
as I say, I'm trying to give an overview, and you'll see that this all comes together. Uh, so postulate two. Uh, this is saying that uh, making a measurement of observable A A and finding value little a collapses the wave function to psi is equal to phi a, where phi a is the eigenfunction associated with the particular value we measured. Right? So we had our uh, a hat phi a is equal to a phi a. So whatever value, and remember we have multiple values we can measure, and each measurable eigenvalue has with it an associated eigenfunction. So if I measure you know, the fifth eigenvalue, then it collapses to that particular eigenfunction. And it leaves it, uh, it leaves it in that state for subsequent measurements. So this was the fact that we measured, say, the uh, spin in the z direction of our silver particle. And if we measured it again, it would still be in the <coughs> up position. And every measurement after that is stayed in the up position. And that's because uh, we went from being in a superposition of possible states into one particular state. And this is uh, a part of quantum mechanics that I, I think is fairly unique. And you'll see that this collapse is, is part of what makes it behave in, in kind of a, a strange fashion. Questions about postulate two? Okay, postulate three. Postulate three. Is that there exists a state function called a wave function that represents the state of the system and any given instance all the information that you can know about the system is contained in that state function. So, we'll call this, uh, there exists a is a state function. Sigh for that. Uh, all possible. Is contained in Psi. Well, we know this is true. And what also is true is, is that we know that our interpretation of the information comes in a st statistical form. And in particular, what we find useful is being able to predict the expectation <coughs> value or the average value for a particular observable. So, So for observable, I'll call capital C. The expectation value of C is equal to the integral psi star C hat, the operator, psi dr. So dr, this is my shorthand for 
triple integral dx, dy, dz from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's over all space. So this is our expectation value. Uh, so remember, expectation values, these are basically averages, right? So C bar is the expectation of C. And if you have a discrete number of items, you know, you're counting, you know, the number of coins in a bag, for example, you know, then C bar is equal to one over n, the number of coins in the bag. Uh, I equals one to n ci, where ci are the values of the coins in the bag, right? So, you know, going back to undergrad stat class, you know, what's the expected value if you keep drawing coins from a bag? That would be it. Now, going from a discrete system to a continuous system, this becomes the integral C PC DC and the integral is over all of the space, so it's the one dimensional space, you're going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is the expectation value uh, of C. Now, we had this as our definition. Now, uh, right, from right to left here. Uh, we had this as our definition, uh, but we know that C operator operating on the wave function is equal to a measurable value, <clears throat> wave function back, you know, which means that we're basically looking here at we're looking here at uh, integral c is just a value like you know four, right? And if you take the integral of a constant, you can pull the constant out front which means that you have C times some uh, psi star psi is equal to C e, C. <clears throat> Narrow C. So these all come together. Uh, our definition is consistent with having psi star psi being the probability. Postal 3 okay? You'll see how it all comes together shortly. Uh, so going to postulate 4, again, a fairly short one. Uh, the state function evolves according to the Schrodinger time-dependent equation. Two I H bar D by D T psi function of position and time is equal to a Hamiltonian operator, psi r t. And this is the shooting or time dependent uh, equation. Uh, this is true in non relativistic which is everything we're going to cover here. Uh, if you need to go to relativistic effects, then evolves according to the Dirac equation. Which is, and 
I'm just writing it down so that you can say you've seen it at some point in your life. Maybe you'll use it, I don't know. the Dirac equation. Again, I've never actually solved it uh, for my work, but uh, it may be something that you should at least know it exists. So that's postulate four. And, and these four postulates uh, give us really the basis for everything that we do. And the reason they work out is really tied into the linear uh, Hermitian uh, operators. And why that happens is that if you have your operator got your eigen system to solve. Uh, the fact that the operators are linear operators means that these eigen functions are orthonormal, meaning that if I take the integral of psi, say, j, star, psi, i, dr, so I integrate those over all space, they're equal to delta j i. That's the Kronegger delta. Meaning that is equal to 1 if j equals i, zero, else. And this is a consequence of what's called the Sturm-Louisville theorem. Uh, and if you've taken partial differential equations, uh, you've probably seen this. So what this means is it means that the set of eigenfunctions form a set of functions that span what we call Hilbert space. Space is a functional space. It's a space functions live, right? Uh, it, it's a functional space, and you, you can think of it as equivalent to a Euclidean space. So, Euclidean space is a space where vectors live, right? So, you've got your vector space. And this Euclidean space. You'll have some uh, set of vectors, qi, and uh, if those set of vectors you know, are orthonormal, and span space, 
that they can act as a basis to describe all other vectors in that space. And you know, this can go out and, in fact, Hilbert's space is infinite dimensional. You can have an infinite, infinite dimensional Euclidean space as well. But I mean, just thinking about this in terms of you know, two dimensional space, right? If you have, you know, whatever, Q1 and Q2, such that Q1 dot Q2 equals zero and Q write this out, qi dot qj is equal to the corner of delta, and they span the space, then that means if you have some other vector, v, v can be written out as sum of, you know, alpha i, qi, i equals one, two, well, in this case, two, but in principle, we have an infinite space. So just as, just as uh, in this Euclidean space, these vectors can just form a basis that can describe any vector in our Hilbert space, which is a complex, infinite, functional space, this set of eigenfunctions are orthonormal and span space, so they're a basis that can describe any function that can live in that Hilbert space. And this is, is why, you know, if you want to have a, what's called a more actively functional understanding of quantum mechanics, it's good to move from differential equations to vector matrix notation, because everything in this vector matrix notation maps exactly <coughs> from Euclidean space onto Hilbert space, except now we'd be describing functions as vectors. Uh, it's also useful to work in what's called a, a bra-ket space, uh, in which instead of having you know, real functions and real vectors, we have uh, abstractions that, that we can move around, but we can still project those out into uh, different subsets of that space. Is that okay? Well, we'll see examples, and then you'll see how it, how it fits together. So let's uh, let's look at putting some of these some of these uh, postulates together, and, and some of what we know about vectors. So we know that our wave function can be written out as a linear sum of eigenfunctions. So I can say. Uh, you know, capital Psi, let's call that my wave function, is equal to sum n, c n, phi n, uh, sorry, psi n, all these little size for my uh, uh, eigenfunctions and big psi for my wave function. And I, I can say this uh, these c n, those were the uh, uh, prefactors in front of my uh, vectors in my Euclidean space, and they are here too, and just as they were in Euclidean space, these are the projections of the particular eigenfunction onto, sorry, Projection of the wave function, oh, I've got it backwards, of the wave function onto the particular eigenfunction. Right, so go back to this vector picture. If I have my q1 and my q2, and I've got some vector here, well, what I can do is I can take that and have that projection, and that would be, say, c1. Now like this, call that C2. So now my vector is equal to C1 Q1 plus C2 Q2. And if this was infinite dimensional, we'd have some long sum. Well, here we've got the same thing. Now this is representing how much of 
uh, the wave function is in the direction of a particular uh, eigenfunction. And the value of this, the value of this, C, call this, uh, you know, the ith projection is equal to the integral of dr ci wave function. And, and you can see that, you can see that You can see that by substituting this definition of our wave function, a linear sum of eigenfunctions, in for our wave function. Right? So if we take this, we can have ci is equal to integral dr. Oops, sorry. That has to be complex conjugate. I star times some C n phi n, which is dr psi i C1 phi 1 plus psi i star C2 phi 2 plus dot 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 psi I star C I psi I dot 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 All of these terms in which I is not equal to one, those are gonna to go to zero. And the reason those go to zero is because we can take and do these these uh the sum integration uh, piece after piece and get Integral dr c1 psi i star c1 plus c2 integral dr psi i star c2 uh, psi2 plus dot 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 c i integral c1 c i star c i plus dot 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 dot. All of these due to the definition of orthonormality are zero. This one is one, so I get C1, zero. So I wind up with CI equal to CI. So the fact that we can have a basis that's orthonormal, that spans space, that allows us to write the wave function, gives us a way to describe the wave function is Hilbert space, and we are able to describe the coefficients as the projection of the wave function onto that particular eigenfunction. And taking this and, and, and talking about uh, expectation values, we can have the, the same thing, right? So we think about our expectation value. So we had this expectation value of well, observable O, right? Which was the integral psi star O hat psi. Well, we can substitute in our linear sum of eigenfunctions for psi star and psi to get integral of C1 star psi 1 star plus C2 star psi 2 star plus dot 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 O hat C1 psi 1 plus C2 psi 2 plus dot dot dot. Then we multiply that out, and when we multiply that out, we get terms, and we get a bunch of terms, but all of those terms well, look like C i star uh, 
psi i star o hat c j psi j. And we have double sum over i and j. And again, c, i, and c, j, they're just values, so they can get pulled out front. So this integral is going to look like c, i, star, c, j, integral, psi, i, star, psi, j. And because of the orthonormality, it's going to be equal to c, i, star C J del I J. So all of the terms are going to go to zero except for the terms in which I is equal to J, which means that our expectation value becomes sum of O I P O I one two it's an infinite sum O I right and it also means that this probability is O I C I squared so the probability of measuring a particular value is given by the coefficient, which is the projection of the wave function onto that particular eigenfunction. So, P O I to C I. And if you think about this kind of physically, if you go back to vector space, it kind of makes sense because we're saying that if I have a vector and it's mostly in, say, you know, the one direction, then it's going to have a behavior which is most similarly, you know, related to that. But it's, it's not, you know, perfectly that. There's still a probability of measuring it in the other directions as well. So when I talk about superpositions, I'm talking about a superposition as a linear sum of eigenfunctions. With each eigenfunction, there is a coefficient, which is the projection of the wave function onto that eigenfunction. And that tells us the probability of measuring a particular value. Right, so going back to the Stern-Gerlach example, Marker, the breather. Uh, going back to Stern Gerlach, we have an operator called uh, S sub Z hat. It operates on a function, chi, returns a value, S Z. There's two solutions only. At least in the case of, of the silver atom. That is SZ is equal to plus H bar over 2, or SZ is equal to minus H bar over 2. And these correspond to what we're going to call uh, chi up or chi down, or spin up or spin down. So when we had that initial beam of uh, atoms that were passing through vacuum, initially we didn't know anything about the state. And we said, well, it's randomized.
which means that psi is equal to 1 over square root of 2 psi or chi up plus i over square root of 2 chi down. And there is a degree of flexibility in how you pick the coefficients in as much as uh, they can be they can have to be accurate uh, you can change the uh, phase of the wave but you can't change the magnitude and, and we'll talk about this later but I pick these uh, to give an example uh, so this is uh, the case of a superposition. And the probability of measuring h bar over 2 is equal to 1 over square root of 2 multiplied by 1 over square root of 2. The probability of measuring minus h bar over 2 is equal to minus i over square root of 2, i over square root of 2 is equal to 1 half. Notice that uh, my wave function is normalized, right? So the probabilities are equal to 1, right? We said early on that uh, we have to define our system as being normalized, and if I were to go through this and it wasn't normalized, then I'd have to go through and scale this vector, or scale this uh, wave function, in order to make sure that it's normalized. But that's just the same thing as scaling a vector. You put some coefficient out in front, and you multiply everything by that coefficient until you get a normalized uh, wave function. But here, uh, what we have is we have a uh, 50% 50, 50 chance of measuring it in the up state and a 50% chance of measuring it in the down state. So now let's say that we measure it and let's say we measure uh, up. Well, that means that now psi is equal to chi up. And another way to write that would be equal to uh, 1 chi up plus 0 chi down, which means that we just change the probabilities. So now, after measurement, the probability of measuring it in the uh, up position is equal to 1, and the probability in the down is now 0. measure the SY, and we can get chi, well, let's, let's call this chi uh, X now, chi Y, and we can get chi Y up, or chi Y down. Uh, and basically, what I'm going to show you is that the S, X, Z, and Y are incommensurate observables. And what makes them incommensurate is that they are two different descriptions of the same Hilbert space. So if I wanted to, well, that's a, in order to stay consistent with the notes I have, let's, let's say, uh, so let, let's say, uh, so that's the z direction, and I, I, in my notes I called it uh, sy squiggle is equal to sy squiggle. And I can get sy equals plus 
h bar over 2 with an up or s y equals minus h bar over 2 if I measure it in the down state. Now, what makes quantum mechanics work is that I can write my wave function as or as sorry up down to down right you can write the same function in two different ways and if you want to think about this in vector space right the vector equivalent is to say equivalent is to say, let's just call this my uh, psi, psi down, psi up, means that if I have my vector, my wave function, thinking in terms of vectors, again, we're really dealing with uh, functions, meaning we have to take that integral to get the projections. But if I wanted to express the probabilities of measuring the uh, z position, so this the z spin, That would be, uh, I'll call this alpha one, and this would be alpha two, or I could express it in terms of the sy by projecting it under this basis, which I'm calling, oh, I'm sorry, I got the one and the twos mixed up. Sorry, this should be one, two, and that makes this theta 2 or theta 1, right? So the implications are that to say that two operators are incommensurate is to say that they don't commute. And if they don't commute, that means that they form different basis sets within our Hilbert space, and we can write them out separately. To say that two operators commute is to say that they're commensurate, and it means that the same basis, for example, uh, energy and momentum, can be used to describe the same wave function. And what it also means here is that if I go over here, you know, I could say, well, I, if I measure the uh, SY component, and let's say I measure it and I find this to be 1, and I find this to be 0, that changes this to alpha 1 prime, alpha 2 prime. It's participating. Uh, alpha 1 prime, alpha 2 prime. Because, <laughs> because what just happened was when I measured, when I measured this uh, in the sy up state, I'm collapsing the wave function. And by collapsing the wave function, this is now prime. So that to say that the wave function collapses is to essentially say that my wave function is now 100% in the 
up and down. It's mixed up. Ah, zero, one. Uh, to measure it 100% in the SY down position, which then has to change my projections in the other spaces. And then I go and I measure, I measure the Z position. So if I measure this to be one, zero, down, then that means that my uh, coefficients or my projections in the Y space, one prime plus Beta 2 down. So that means that I just measured it in the spin up here. So now the wave function is purely in the SZ up position, which now means I have new coefficients for the SY prefactors. And I think this is pretty cool. And what makes it cool from my perspective is that all the math is in place and uh, <clears throat> it plays out across linear algebra space across your uh, you know, differential equation Hilbert space, uh, abstract, abstract uh, group theory space, uh, and all the math existed for so many years before the physics. And it was like it was just kind of waiting for us to, to put it in, and after we adopted this mathematical nomenclature, we make measurements and we find them accurate out to you know, 10 decimal places. So it's the most accurate theory we've ever come up with, really. Uh, the quantum theory of solids uh, is pretty cool. Questions? You'll have questions when you do the homework. Yes? So we're effectively making it snap to one of the axes that was acting as a basis yes. when we measure it. Exactly. So becoming its own projection? It becomes its own projection, but it still has a value of 1. So it is not exactly a projection, it's more of a rotation. Because that uh, it had, the wave function has to have a, a uh, has to be normalized to 1. So I said, quantum, it's a very regular system, but it's a little bit different, and what makes it different is that different observables have different basises to describe the wave function, and making a measurement of one observable in one basis affects the position of the wave function in Hilbert space, which messes up your knowledge of the others. Yeah. So can the, can the coefficients in front of the, the two functions be kind of like, related? can they be related to probabilities? They are. They are exactly related to probabilities. So, so the question is, uh, the coefficients are, uh, if they're related to probabilities, and they are, so uh, in the next example, we're going to do uh, a particle box, but I'll give you a little foreshadowing here, and just simply say that if I measure say, spin up in the z direction, then that changes my coefficients there. These coefficients, the coefficient uh, beta 1 double prime is equal to the integral of uh, z up star wave function dr the 2 double prime is equal to the integral of z down star wave function. And then the probability to measure s y up is equal to beta 1 double prime star beta x beta 1 double prime 
and the probability to measure S Y down is equal to theta 2 double prime star theta 2 double prime. And what we want to do, and then actually if you think about this, if you can solve, and you will, solve the eigenfunction problems to give you your eigenfunctions, then you know what the eigenfunction is. And if you know, oh, well, I'm, so please, I know the value of this, and I know the value of this, and if I make a measurement, so that tells me that psi is equal to chi up, then that lets me substitute in here, chi up, chi up, and that lets me solve the coefficients, which lets me know the probabilities.